Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk, episode uh, 755, not 754, as I put in the show notes. Apologies for that if it was confusing. Uh, but uh, welcome. Yes, I haven't been around for a little while. I had to take last week off because uh, the post NAM kind of lurgy just got the better of me, and it's really hard operating heavy machinery when you've got a woolly head. I still I still feel a little bit under the weather, but um, yeah, it's it's a lingerer. And hopefully I've got a week off to recover because uh, we've got Super Booth coming up next week as well, uh, which I encourage encourage you to uh, do check out. In fact, that well, before I do that, I should probably let people know who don't know what I'm talking about. This is the uh, technology podcast, music technology podcast. We talk about software, production, recording, live performance, all the kind of tech, instruments, software, synth, drum machines and whatnot that surround that entire set of activities. And I want to say thank you very much to our friends over in the IRC. Uh, plenty of you there. Uh, thanks very much again to Wagyu. Uh, Wagyu's moderating as well as uh, um, running the back end, which is why you get to see all of these uh, aggregated comments posting between Twitch, Facebook and YouTube, which is where we stream live. Uh, before I get on, I, I did bother to record a new uh, Patreon thing. Obviously, it's very um, appreciated if you can support us on Patreon, particularly these times when ads are becoming harder to come by. I'll just press a button and then I can introduce myself, introducing myself to Patreon. Have you considered joining us on Patreon? Uh, for a mere couple of cups of coffee a month, maybe one, depending on your taste, you get access to all of our ad-free content. Uh, that's everything we post to YouTube. Monetize is also posted to uh, our Patreon feed. We get a Sonic Talk pre-show. Uh, we also, actually, exclusive videos. I've just posted one of the third wave uh, from Groove Synthesis, which was a great synth. I just reviewed it. Uh, there's some extra video there exclusive to Patreon. Plus, you get samples, downloads, all kinds of other bits and pieces. And if you join before the end of the show at the upper tier, which is still only six bucks a month, you will get your name in credits at the end of every Sonic Talk as a big thank you. Thank you very much for those who already have joined us. Anyway, back to the show. Uh, yes, how meta. Anyway, um, I'll introduce our guest now. Um, so it's great to see uh, Mr. Yoad Nevo, who is there. Um, I think you're, you are in the studio, aren't you? Nevo Sound, uh, with your wall of guitars. Uh, Yoad, of course, is uh, producer, engineer, sample library creator, uh, software developer at Waves, non-commercial, I might add, so don't don't start hassling him about their commercial policies. It's nothing to do with him. Um, and you're in the middle of doing another Nexus library. Is that right, Yoad? Yeah, another guitar library. Um, it's quite big. I'm sampling <laughs> big. everything that, that has strings on it. and mm -hmm. uh, All of that many, stuff behind you. All of that stuff and, and much more. And it's a, it's a big task and it's... A, it's challenging, but it's fun because after you've done the whole process and everything is edited and everything is kind of mapped and you, you play it, it's, it's great. I mean, we just discussed a bit before that it's hard to reproduce the playing of, of guitar on, on keyboards, but, um, and there are certainly people who can do that better than, than I can. When I p play keyboards, it sounds kind of mechanical. It works with piano samples and things like that. But with guitar, I've always find it challenging. But... Oh, oh we've lost him. Okay, I I'll to, let him... Oh, no, he's back. You know, to, to play parts and voicing like, like on a guitar, which makes it more real. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, what, 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 what MIDI guitar but, do you use, by the way? What, uh, I, have what this, um, I have a few. I have the Roland pickup uh, thing. Um, I have a Yamaha kind of brain for it. And I have the T, the V8, the V, V guitar, or something really old. I used to have the TG55, but. I have this one, which is a lot older, which is amazing, the, uh, V8. I think, I, has it got a hexaphonic pickup? Um, yes, it does. And you can, it has, the, the, the reason why I kept this one and so the other one is that it has like a polyphonic pitch shift, which is mm. quantized to key. So you can do like Ooh. all the Brian, Brian May stuff. Not that, not that I use it in, in my kind of productions, but it's so fun to just uh, 
you, you just play one note and you can say like add two or add three more notes yeah and uh, and it's all in key and it, it's amazing uh, oh, but gosh. I also have this uh, kind of fender it's it's by fender so it has the fender logo but it's a plastic thing where mm. you have strings here so you can strum and um, but the rest of it is basically switches it's like the casio the casio or the yamaha was it yes <coughs> yamaha or casio that had the similar similar i think it was the yeah. yamaha wasn't it? it had buttons on each fret the, the, the good thing about it is that it you it never misses a note Oh, you know, God. it's always, you can't, obviously you can't bend and, uh, and it, it doesn't feel great to play, but you, you get the part kind of recorded, which is very, very hard with the, with the Roland pickup. It has so many kind of bum notes and, and things. Right. Uh, that's, uh, Zen I says, uh, he's got Fishman triple play, which is supposed to be really good as well. I've not tried that, but I've heard a lot of good stuff about it. It's been out for a while, hasn't it? The Fishman triple play that does... Uh, MIDI and 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 uh, well, I guess uh, ceramic and mug, uh, pizza and also as a pickup. I yeah, think so, it's got three yeah. outputs. Yeah, it's supposed to be pretty okay, good. Okay, I'll check it. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, lovely to have you, Yoad. And we've also got Mr. Paulie Bow from. I'm going to do it. Hello. There we go. Lovely to see you. It's been a while. Our, 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 um, it has. Our diaries haven't synced for ages, but uh, it's good to have you in person. How are you? I'm much better now. I had norovirus last week, which oh, was dear. absolutely terrible. Great way I to lose weight. I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to, to lose weight, definitely. But would not recommend... You know, if this was TripAdvisor, I'd be leaving a zero-star review <laughs> for norovirus. But, yeah... Um, other than that, I've been very busy. I've got a couple of synths down here that I picked up in the last month, and they're still Ooh. in the boxes, which That's is not a, what, what, like uh, me. What the heck? <laughs> yeah, I've got... I went a bit wavetable crazy, so I got a, a Micro Monster 2. Jumped on it because there's a very sort of... Um, there's a waiting list for the, um, the Micro Monster 2. Um... And that when they come out, then they email everyone and they're sold like that. It's like a little sort of, I think it's under £300 kind of VA slash wavetable synth. Um, and I also got a Waldorf M behind me as well. Oh, did you? Ah, um, yeah, I did. Nice. I told you I was going to get one for ages. So I'm going to be comparing that to my microwave XT and seeing who's the, the king of the Waldorf wavetables. Well, I mean, I've just done the third wave groove synthesis word day, word, uh, uh, the groove synthesis w third wave, uh, yeah. which is a big review. It's like 40 minutes of review. It was, I have to say, in terms of wavetable synths, it, it, it's probably the, you know, the pinnacle. I mean, to be fair, I mean, if you didn't, if you wouldn't constrain, if you were designing a synth and you didn't bother constraining yourself to any sort of budget, so it, the final price is five <laughs> grand, then maybe yes. you would, maybe you'd come up with something similar. But uh, I mean, you know, so they haven't had to, to work to a budget yet. They've done a sort of, bit of a it. blue sky synth, uh, but it does sound amazing. And I didn't realise it. I, I sent the review over for a fact check because it's, you know, with something this complex, I'm bound to misrepresent something. And I didn't yeah. realise that it's got two filters. It's got a SEM filter and uh, a Dave Rossum designed a uh, low pass filter, which is really yeah. nice with saturation. The SEM is digital. It's all DSP, and I didn't realize it. It is. And, uh, yeah, I was complete. Wild. Yeah, I didn't read the manual, obviously. <laughs> but yeah, what I like about the M is you can, uh, unlike any other one on the market, really, the, the designer put all sorts of weird little things in, you know, little experiments. And so you can load up a, a 64 kilobyte 8-bit sample as one of the oscillators so right. you can have like a wavetable in one and maybe like a fairlight sample in the other then run it through the ssms so i'm going to be doing a lot of experimenting like that really that's that's kind nice. of one thing the m has which nothing else has how much ram has it got how much ram is it it's tiny two, 256 yeah. kilobytes Woo! <laughs> at once but you can store more in flash but it's old school and that's what i like 
you know, I I've think, got like. I think you can. Uh, I think you can draw the the oscillators on the microwave XT. Um, yes. And dump them th- uh, through system exclusive, um, and then it it, it has sixty four uh, frames. Slices. Slices. And you can, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, very really cool. very old school. Yeah, yeah, love it. Wow. So I'm going to be experimenting with that and uh, and seeing what happens and maybe like do a little video on it. Although at the moment I'm kind of uh, working on this massive Amiga soft synths video that I talked about last time, covering yeah. these these uh, soft synths from the mid '80s to about 1992, and all the some of them are wavetable and FM and stuff like that. So that's going to be an unusual vid to watch. Uh, when it comes out, probably next week. Yeah, I like these. Uh, the the no one really talks about the history of soft synths as much as hardware no. synths. So, and I have to go against the grain in everything. You know this, Nick. So <laughs> that that's that oppositionally defiant. <laughs> Fair enough. Oh, before I get on to any more stuff, I just wanted to uh, have a quick uh, mention that uh, Emoms. There's an Emom in. I think it's in. Uh, oh, is it in Sheffield? Uh, let me see. Uh, gosh, uh, uh, I was asked. Yeah. Anyway, check out the Emom dates. There's one. There, there's there's ones coming up soon. I think there's a big one in Sheffield. So uh, do check them out. Uh, and we'll be doing another one at some point, but not quite as close to. Uh, to, Na- uh, to Nam and Superbooth, as I thought, because as I said, Superbooth is next week. We go to Berlin. Next week we fly to Berlin. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to that, and maybe we can get around to talking to some of that stuff. But we do have some topics as well. Um, and for, well, let's start with the uh, this one because I suppose it feels like this should be some form of um, there should be some form of celebration, sort of you know, a firework display or <laughs> champagne or something. Hey <laughs> everybody, finally... this is Dennis from the NAP. They get the NAM show 2023 here in Anaheim, and we're showing Orange Vocoder 4. Uh, is that new? Yeah, because it's going to be shipping now on May 1st. The wait is over. It was like 200 years or more, but now it's finally done. <laughs> Let me show you real quick what this beast of a plugin does. So here's my vocal that I'll be vocoding. Yeah, I encourage you to watch the full demo, but I mean, I, I thought we should mark the occasion, even though, you know, it's uh, vocoders are kind of niche. But I, I think there's a lot of stuff that you can do with this specific vocoder. And I, I remember using hardware vocoders. I think I used an EMS uh, vocoder at, at 100. I can't remember what it was now. It was, uh, but I borrowed it off Will Gregory and I used it. And I just remember using the drums as the modulator and some chords as a carrier. There's lots of really interesting creative review uh, mm-hmm. uh, uses. But um, is, this one's got a built-in synth. Uh, it's 149 dollars 159 euros until the th- end of may and then it goes up to 249279 but as with all of the synaptic stuff synaptic is kind of a, a, a wacky and unusual you can tell how long it is because the last time we shot anything about it, his hair was really short and now it's really <laughs> long so i mean you know it's that that's how we go um i don't know whether vocoders get a lot of a look in in most people's stuff but i suppose the better they are you can almost use them as as kind of quite convincing backing vocals i know you uh, yeah i'd use like harmonizers and stuff i've heard that in your when when we did your uh, mix mm-hmm. breakdown of the track you did for the uh, sonic ep there were some harmonizers in there do you find vocoders are, are useful um i'm sure yeah, waves have got yeah, one, I, but, them. Uh, I use them a lot and actually speaking about the world of xt uh, that's what I used for carrier sounds for the Waves Morf Order, oh, okay. um, which is an FFT uh, vocoder. And we have the, the Ovox, which is another vocoder. But uh, the Synaptic one, that's the kind of incarnation of uh, the Orange vocoder, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. That's right, yeah. Which, you know... If it just has that sound, the kind of default orange vocoder original VST one sound, and it runs on M1, that alone is is a great reason to to get it because that sound is just amazing. Nothing else, nothing else makes it. And even today, I don't think it has such a distinct sound. Um, and and I, I looked at the specs and it seems like they added a lot of very cool 
features and it's very versatile and modern and everything. And I, I'm sure they must have kept the, yeah, the ability to, to have that, that original sound. But that was amazing. It's kind of glass and and just goodness. It's, it's so digital, but it's just what you want to hear. Uh, it's was amazing. It, was, the origi- was the original, was it ProSonic or, um, that did the original? I think, I can't remember if it I was or remember. not. I don't remember. Because it wasn't, it wasn't Zynaptic, and I, I, I just can't remember. No, it, it wasn't. Could. No, it wasn't. I don't know, Paulie. Uh, vocoders, they for you? This one looks quite interesting because the synth has through zero FM on it, which is cool. Um, and some audio rate LFOs. So you're bound to get some interesting sounds from it. But um, yeah, uh, my favourite vocoder sound, when I was, you know, sort of like 16, misspent youth and a bit of a goth, I listened to a, a Marilyn Manson song, of all things, and it was called something like Crypt or Child. And it had a vocoder on it that was arpeggiating, you know, like, say, a minor chord that was arpeggiating fast. Almost yeah. like a Commodore 64 Sid-like sound. And I've been addicted to that sound ever since, basically. Whenever I use a vocoder, I won't play chords through it. I'll, I'll run a really fast arpeggio. Um, and then maybe a bit of reverb. And I think it just sounds quite creepy and cool when you do that. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, what, that's are, my they're... favorite vocoder thing. Nice. There's always, I mean, I think, I, I imagine something, a vocoder like this, anyway, a vocoder like this is bound to have lots of nooks and crannies to explore. And it's, that's yeah. the thing, once you start getting all of this technology in your arsenal, you know, it's just a question of, hopefully, I mean, the ideal is they don't just find the preset that everybody has to use. Somebody actually makes something and makes it do something that, you know, perhaps wasn't considered in some of the presets. I'm sure it comes with plenty of presets anyway. But, uh, yeah, do check them out. And, yes, uh, Steve Elbows did say, yes, it was ProSonic back in 1998. So uh, I I think I've, I've, I've uh, 1-0. Um, anyway, <laughs> if, if anyone's keeping score. <laughs> OK, uh, let's have a look. I'll we'll probably do... Uh, a, 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 an ad from our friends over at uh, Baby Audio because they've got a new synth out. Indeed, the BA1, which they describe as a modern reimagination of a cultish and innate. Well, it's basically the uh, Yamaha CSO1, isn't it? Uh, it? It sounds like it, it brings you pure and authentic textures, but also they've added stuff like an additional polyphony, second analog model, model oscillator, FM, and the ability to drain the battery, which gives it power sag. Uh, that running down the original they used to have. That's available at 49 bucks at the moment, uh, coming back uh, to 99 bucks soon. You can save 15% by using the new code, I would add, ST2023. So if you're interested in, in that, do check it out. Once again, we thank them for their support. Much appreciated. OK, let's see what we got next. Um, I, oh, well, I think this is going to be... Um, well, actually, let's go, let's go microphone, but just because... I don't know what it is that Teenage Engineering keep doing, but they just keep doing it and they don't, they just don't care. Hi, do I'm Alberto from Teenage Engineering. I'm the electronic engineer behind our ultra portable condenser microphone, CM15. I'm going to introduce it to you. It comes in this durable box that you can use for storage. Inside... All those kind of lovely teenage engineering. I mean, I think the last thing we got from them was the table, which I sort of rather amusingly was going to... Uh, going to offer uh, offer them a, a sponsorship slot in the uh, EMON because we need like a bunch of tables <laughs> and I just thought but they're like a thousand quid each you know and they and they look yeah. a little bit like if I'm honest they look like a slightly more robust pasting table I'm sure there's more to it than that but I didn't do that in the end but yeah this is the new thing this is the uh, CM15 which is like a portable large diaphragm it's made by Peluso the capsule uh, it's got uh, ESS Sabre uh, Pro analog to digital converters, OPA JFETs, you know, 48 vant and power, also got USB and um, XLR outputs, 3.5 millimeter line output. I mean, it's all very teeny tiny, so I guess you could go yeah. directly into your mixer. So that signal path from your 1200 euros mic into your 2000 euros uh, tiny little mixer and then into your computer, I suppose would be, you'd have a full teenage engineering signal path, which I don't know. I mean, it may be, 
that that's a great mic. It's just very hard to kind of see past the uh, the cash. It feels perhaps bizarrely, even though it's a tiny little thing, it somehow feels less ridiculous than a, a thousand dollar table. I don't know. I'm not really sure. a mic's a mic person. I don't. Uh, yeah. Do you think? Do you think that you know for a portable system? I know because a lot of people who've got the uh, and experienced the uh, the TX. 16 the mixer they say is one of the most beautiful and really useful things and i would love to try one out but i mean you know i'm just not prepared to take the chance that it might not be for me mm -hmm. given that price do you think this is something that would that would fit i mean you couldn't put this in front of one of your artists and say please take me seriously in my massive studio with this tiny little mic that no but there was um on one of the photos or, or videos there was a picture of it kind of um lying flat on the on mm. the table and that to me looks like a very useful place to have it like your phone you know it's just there without mm. the the stand and everything right. and i wonder whether it's kind of insulated or like there's a shock mount or something that you can uh, actually okay. put it on the phone and it will um not vibrate and and things like that because then it's really useful to either you know speak or sing or play you know there are a few times that i use the the mac the the laptop mic um and it sounds good and the phone and things like that and and there's no reason why you shouldn't have something on your desk that sounds mm. decent and it's yeah. not too directional from this far. So you can just play something on the table, then mess it up, or just to have access to audio kind of instantly and without having to drag a stand and a shock mount mm. and, and, and everything. Yeah. I like I like that idea. Uh, I use the phone a lot to, to record stuff and... Uh, and, and it's handy to have and when you and you know you set it at the desk all day and it's nice to have uh, something that you can yeah like 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 this when it's lying flat on the table right i That's see what yeah. kind of appeal to me more than than anything i else. would be i don't know i would be very surprised because it's so thin i'd be surprised if there's enough shot i remember i reviewed it was little samson i think it was called a go mic a very long time ago really nice idea or maybe it's the rocket mic it looked a bit like a, a an, an old um one of those old sort of rock and roll mics but the the, the mechanical noise of it it made it completely you know you would touch anything in the building sort of anywhere near it and it would just go boot it would be just continually yeah. booming and i suspect i mean much as i love the the concept of some, what teenage engineering are doing and it looks beautiful and i'm sure it's in given the right circumstances it'll be fantastic i suspect that there will be a there's potential for a bit of form over function well like there was mm. with the modular stuff which looked lovely but in practice was a nightmare to use for various mm. reasons i won't go into i don't know i mean it feels like 1200 euros somehow seems you know not that expected for a large diaphragm mic if it's a good mic and it's got mm. it's got a decent a to d and it's got a utility to it but it's sort of it, it's going to need some kind of shock mount stand i suspect i i, I mean, like the idea I, I think you're being very generous with the idea it might be able to do that but i think it's so unlikely that it's going to work on a table without going boom 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 every time you go anywhere near it but maybe maybe we can be proved wrong i don't know um secretly though don't you want the entire range of their things really um kind of i think you know my technology kind of uh lust is for kind of older obsolete things but i can get that people because it does have quite a look to it doesn't it it has a design language not too dissimilar from like a casio vl tone and then the little you know then little things going off that mic looks to me kind of like an old telefunken kind of reporter's microphone that they'd have on a desk you know when they're interviewing someone right. um, but yeah i think we're kind of used to paying lots for tiny small things with microphones aren't we so that's maybe suppose, why yeah. it doesn't it doesn't seem as as extortionate but yeah proof will be in the in in using it won't it and uh and knocking the table and seeing what happens well, I know Cuckoo's really into a lot of their stuff, and he's also into his sort of portable setup, so I'm sure, because he posts sure. uh, 
endlessly on Instagram about his travel setups, which is, I mean, I, I sound like I'm criticising. I'm not, actually. I find it quite interesting. But yeah. I'd be, I, he's really, also really into microphones, so I think he'll probably yes. be the person who gives it a good workout. And probably because he's in Sweden as well, I'd imagine he's going to get his hands on one earlier. I mean, undoubtedly, they will sell out. I mean, I think they sell a lot of their things because they're things, they make things that look very desirable. And make, much as we might make fun of them, it's still, you know, in this case... I still secretly, like I say, I still secretly want the mixer because the idea cool. of reducing, I mean, I'm in a reductionist mode, you know, every time I do a show now, because we did the NAM show, we did it with phones rather than all the yes. stuff we used to carry around. And I left after three days at NAM feeling much, le much, le much less physically destroyed, you know, which ca it can be very, so those it, things um, do make a certain difference. Was it the same setup you used at Synthfest? More or less, more or less. Yeah, yeah, I liked seeing that, and the, it was ingenious how you use the phone on the little mount with the. So I mean, you know, I, I, and I really like the idea of maybe you know if the if the if the TE mixer would actually be able to record more than one track, then it would be. But it yes. would just be ridiculous. I mean, we use Zoom P4s, really which good. are 159 quid, <laughs> not <Yes>. two grand. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just very different. Uh, and we got four rigs, so that would be eight grand on, on audio Oof. interfaces for... <laughs> <laughs> yeah that'd be hilarious anyway um we have to cover it you know it's it feels like it's a good a good thing i'm glad um i'm glad it exists i think the jury's out on it but uh it may be i mean a large diaphragm mic i mean if you get the housing like you say right you know, i mean it can sound great but i i just feel that maybe so large diaphragm microphones kind of need a certain amount of mass to them don't they just so that you you so that you can control the resonances and all of that kind of thing i mean that's what that's what um. i understood anyway yeah, and also I presume it's a cardioid mic um, where I was talking more about a kind of omni configuration. Mm. Uh, and for the cardioid element of it to work, you have to, it can't be facing the table. So the back of it yeah. should be, um, you know, not, not covered in any way. Uh, otherwise, you kind of get a messed up uh, omnidirectional mm. microphone, just the wrong sort of thing but uh yeah i'm just, I, looking, I love to, I'm just looking to see yeah. what what it doesn't mention the polar pattern hmm. which is a bit I'm, of an I'm sure it's uh yeah because there's no switching of polar patterns in vocal recording uh, yeah multi-use i'm just trying to find it here i mean it, the the pictures look fantastic but it doesn't say Oh, look, you could plug four of them into your TE mixer. You, you're not showing the <laughs> screen, by the way. No, I can't see it. I, I, I need to, um, let me see if I can get it in there, because I'll have to go, let me just see. Might be able to, um, can I? I don't know if I can. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't see, I, I don't think I can. I'm trying to figure out if I can just, um, no, I don't think there's a way. But uh, check the check the website out. But I can't see anything about polar pattern, and the fact that it's not specifically mentioned does make me ring a few alarm bells. Um, that uh, that maybe it's not going to be all that. But anyway, I thought we'd throw it in there. Seems like a good uh, a good topic to have. Uh, obviously, um, right. So um, let's get back to. Um, let's see what the time is now. Yeah, we'll go for um, the new UVI homage to Kawhi. Why not? Bunch of ka uh, kawaii actually. It's the K1, K3, K4, K5, R100, and XD5, which I'm not familiar with. K1M, there we go. I just went up. What did I have? I had a K K1 keyboard, I think. K3U, I'm cool. I didn't recognize that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do. So they model this. This is all going to show up in, uh, I guess it's UVI, the Falcon uh, player. So you don't need the full version of Falcon. I think it's uh, available now, 89 bucks till the uh, May the 8th, uh, regular price, 149 But uh, UVI do a lot of kind of decent sample libraries and sample stuff. And I know that the Falcon engine is very highly thought of because not only you've got the raw samples mm. in there, but you've got an awful lot of great building blocks. But I yeah. mean, Kawhi's, Paul. Paulie, you've got a, you know, Ray. Oh, we got a 50 uh, I used either. to have that one. Yeah. This, uh, this oh, is, you must have I could, a, have, I could have grabbed the five, but it's a bit heavier. 
Um, yes, yeah, so I've got nearly all of them. Um, the I've, the only two I don't have are the K3, which is digital waves into an analog filter, and the K the K five thousand, which is the last synth they ever did, which was mm. additive with a kind of depending on which version you got, like a VA type knobby affair. But I've got the others, um, and what I like about them is they they interestingly cover nearly the whole range of synth fashion from <laughs> the mid 80s so it starts with the k the i think it started with the k3 where you've got your samples into analog filters and it looks a bit like a jx8p so at the time it was kind of going up against those membrane button nerfed dx7 interfaces Moving on to the K5, which is additive, which I'm still wrestling with because it is quite difficult to use <laughs> and kind of like doing a spreadsheet. Um, and then moving on later to the kind of sample based instruments, which are kind of my favorite. K1, which had 8 bit waves, no filters. Then the K4 was 16 bit with some digital resonant filters. And importantly, for most of the sounds I like to make, they had AM or ring mod, basically, uh, right. between the waveforms. So a lot of my patches, and I need to put this link into the chat. Uh, here's a demo that I did of the K11, which is a later, a later one. It's basically like a K4 with a double the polyphony and a terrible user interface. Um, <laughs> What I love about them is the the kind of the ROM waveforms, depending on which one you get, can be quite lo-fi and gritty. There's some quite lo-fi choirs in there. They never mm. sounded as kind of lifeless and polished as like the Korg M1, for instance. The Korg M1 always sounded kind of perfect, to me at least. I don't know if that's a fair assessment. It had a perfect kind of digital sound. Whereas the the Kawai K4 is very rough and ready. The the filters just resonate at the drop of a hat wildly. <laughs> and uh it's got a bit of that kind of uh a bit of that kind of almost analogy kind of spirit, even though it's uh it's digital. So I absolutely love the Kawai's and if UVI are listening, I'm happy to uh to do a free pack for your product. And I'll sample some of my weird patches because I assume what they've done, and I've listened to some demos and they sound really good. I assume that they've mainly sampled factory presets and things like that. Maybe some custom patches. But yeah, if they want some really weird stuff to add to it, um, just, just oh, an send me an email. Nice. And I'll send some, I... some synth patches and drum patches. As I said, I've, I've, I've... got a link down there with a the demo. Okay, I can't see it anywhere. I'm not sure where you sent it to because it didn't show. If you should put put it in either uh, okay. YouTube chat or IRC, it'll show up and people can use it. Uh, I, well, it was a SoundCloud quickly, link, so God knows. Oh, I don't know. I don't know where it went. The the thing that's interesting about uh, I remember getting the KY uh, uh, um, because it was a sort of poor man's D50 at the time. What I remember because mm -hmm. I think there were four there was there were four layers to a patch, and also the thing about yeah. the KY. K the Ka sorry Kawai uh, K1 is it had a really nice synth action keyboard. I remember the keyboard was really and I I I can't remember if it did have aftertouch or not. But I remember buying it for my musical partner at the time. He wanted something to play with, and I remember just sort of basically requisitioning it because it felt so nice to play. It was a great master keyboard. I know yeah I don't know if you've got any Kawai stuff. Um, yeah. They now sort of seem to be kind of pianos and you know they've gone they've, they've left all of this legacy behind, which is a real shame. Yeah, no, I mean, I started with uh, K5, actually, K5M, which I still have, which is an amazing additive synthesizer with either 64 or 128 pins um, that you can either draw manually, but the, the, the nice thing about it is that you can assign each one to one of four envelopes. And these are free drawn, so you can have any type of, I, if I remember correctly, I, otherwise they're like the Yamaha thing with level and uh, time. I think maybe right. that's more of the case. But anyway, very complex envelope. 
but you can say, I want all the odd harmonics to go to envelope A, all the even ones to go to envelope B. Oh, wow. And, yeah. and then you can also tilt all the harmonics. So even if you draw something in manually, you can then manipulate it by tilting or separating the odd and, and even harmonics, and you can assign them to different envelopes. It's a really, really yeah. cool. Uh, the sound quality is kind of 8-bit or 10 or whatever, but it's very noisy and kind of um, very early 80s uh, digital. Um, and then I have, and I have the K4 as well, which uh, is really gritty and and the, the samples are it's just great because you don't need to do anything to them and you can't even if you wanted to because it's so <laughs> squashed and it's so you know the, it's like it is what it is uh, but it packs a lot of power like the drums um, and the strings are kind of horrible but they have a lot of presence i know what you so, mean there was that so, low fi I'd like to put a shout out for the uh, the R50 and the R100 uh, um, drum machines because yeah, they had because so, I, I went through a phase I was collecting lots of drum machines uh, samples anyway but for when I was working early golf rap stuff and they kept the the R50 and I think the R100 they had put very Man, specific too. kick and snares just re yeah. the kick had something. I mean, it was quintessentially 80. There's something really wet about the smack of it. It was very different to the Lin. It had a certain... Yeah, you, yeah you, because it was, uh, it was snare two. The first one was a normal one, and the, and the snare number two was sampled with the, the reverb. So it, and, and it was really short, so it was like a gated reverb yeah. built into it. It was great. I had, I had the R50 at the time, uh, I couldn't afford the, the the 100, so every time I had to record it, only had left and right, so I had to mm. to record it kind of multiple times and stuff. To, yeah. My um nice. my favorite one is is basically a Kawai K4, but with with a different ROM set, mainly drums, and it's called the I'm looking at it now, the oh, Kawai yeah. X, XD5. Mm -hmm. And they are quite expensive now. They've um, got that, and it's in a this, rack. Actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. Um, I've but not, it still I've has the it still has the ring mod, so you can go up to Absolute Town and create Absolute nice. Mayhem with it. <laughs> well, it sounds like it's worth checking out this thing just purely because I mean the difficulty in programming. If you want to get hold of a bunch of those sounds, and I would I would say if they because they've got some of the drum machines and even just for the drum samples there's a certain yeah. freshness to do with them and they process for, they are very heavily processed but you can then do more with them they eq really nicely and i remember if I remember there's there's some really interesting um symbols and hi-hats and also kind of like electronic percussion sort of zips and zaps and thips and all of that mm -hmm. sort of thing there's, some of those are really nice too so i, I can't speak we, um, for, uh, much of the other stuff I, yet. I saw in the chat we didn't actually discuss the plugin <laughs> we actually oh. we discussed oh. the synths but not the plugin but as far as i know they've they've multi sampled a lot of the instruments and with the with the regular version you get there's kind of um control over the filter and amp envelopes and you can do a bit of synthesis i think there's a couple of effects as well but if you really want to go to town i think you have to basically buy falcon and wow. then you can open up all of the extra functionality and you'd probably end up with something that was actually far more in scope than than any of the kawaii instruments with falcons extra you know um opportunities um but yeah i think the hardware's getting more and more expensive so if you want a bit of ka kawaii flavor in your tracks i think it's probably a good idea Oh, um, just per, per, personally though if you're going to grab one cheap probably the k1 is a good gateway drug um right just because it's got it doesn't have a filter but it has some really nice lo-fi waves 
So I'm just trying yeah. to figure out why I can't seem to get my uh, my browser to open because I was just trying to do that because uh, as someone put, there's a, a MPCX special edition just come out. I'm just looking. It doesn't look like there's anything much different about it apart from perhaps more more internal uh, specification. Can't tell. So that's breaking news. Sorry, I, I can't really say much more about it than that. Um, but yes, well, we'll stop there and I'll just uh, play a message sure. from our friends over at Isotope because um, because I can. Ozone 10 is the future of mastering. The new version includes Master Assistant, match your master to any reference file or files. Also, the Stabilizer module in advance adds clarity with intelligent and adaptive mastering EQ. Also included is the Impact module in advanced, which enhances the rhythm by controlling microdynamics. Don't forget the code SONIC10 at isotope.com forward slash SONIC TALK to save an additional 10% off any software purchase, not including subscriptions. And we thank them very much for their support uh, over the, well, the continuing support. Hopefully we'll get to see them soon. I haven't seen them. Uh, they weren't at NAM and they won't be at Superbooth, as far as I can tell. There's often um, just the people from the mothership or whatever the company's called. I can't remember what they're called now. But anyway, thanks very much to them. Um, OK, who wants to go? Um, what, what should we have next? Because we've got a, f a few topics, but there's sort of, it's a bit, uh, yeah, the, um, the, the, there's the Softube Model 80, which also came out, which is kind of an interesting one. So the Profit 5, we can throw that one in. Why don't we do that? We'll just, I'll plus play the video. So, yeah, um, they don't do many synths, but when they do, they tend to kind of go large. So this is Model 80. It's actually a five voice, limited to five voice, uh, Profit 5. And the th interesting thing about it, as well as all the kind of the precision model that, modeling that they do, they've also added, um, modules that you can bring into Softune Modular, which I think is actually quite a unique and interesting concept and one that's probably worth celebrating to a degree. Haven't had a chance to check it out yet, but uh, that's I think it's, again, that's available. It seems to be, you always get free summer um, software instrument releases, so uh, 99 bucks from 159 for the Softune. I think it's iLock, um, which some people do or don't get on with, but uh, remember, you can always do it with uh, iLock online. You don't have to actually have an iLock. Uh, P5, though. Yoad, have you got a P5? I don't. Um, and to be honest, I'm... Yeah, I'm not too crazy. I don't know. I know it, it's an iconic synth and stuff, but it's uh, to me, it sounds a bit kind of one-dimensional. Uh, as okay. maybe all of them do, like the, yeah. the Juno, like does one thing, but it does it great. And I guess it's just a matter of taste. I like the sync, obviously, sound on the, you know, on the Prophet Five. But uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of more like a Poly Six Juno Interesting. type of person. It's I, I I you know what I I don't I don't disagree with you there I've never I mean I've I've had the opportunity to play a couple of Prophet Fives and they've never made me go, oh there's just something about mm. this that I really must have I think there's yeah. an era of nostalgia and also maybe it requires a bit more work because obviously there's some sounds in there that you know the people uh, like Japan got out of theirs and you know various other synthesis yes. and there's obviously the and talking heads of you know, my life. Yeah, all of that stuff. But I don't know if that, I don't know how much of that is actually Prophet 5 and some of it was other synths as well. So, you know, I don't know. But this looks a like a lot of good... it was Prophet 5, I think. I just oh, cool. wanted to do, do a little pick. Have I mentioned this before? I've got a Prophet 600 and like and it shares some of the same chips with the Prophet 5, but I find it a little bit one dimensional as Yoad was saying. If you have a Prophet 5 or any mono synth you got to buy one of these. It's a, an Arion SCHZ pedal. Right. Run your Profit 5 through or your Profit 600 through that. It sounds like a million dollars. It for, Somehow it firms up the low end whilst chorusing the top end. It's just incredible. That's and it's analog. That's really interesting. So That's a, did you about, know? Because in that, in that. 60 quid or something. Okay. In that demo, the thing that was the most upfront and most impressive was actually the low end, the bass line, which sounds yes. very much like it's got some chorus on it because it's moving around yes. in kind of yeah. the world. So I wonder if they modelled that because it's a classic signal path or something. I don't know. Could. Um, I Could. mean, it's a bargain. I mean, it's not expensive, <laughs> yes. is it? And also, Total and bargain. also, 
And also, if you've got SoftTube Modular, having access to some of those things into your software, because SoftTube Modular kind of gets a bit of a bad rep just purely because it's going up against um, VCV Rack, which is free. But it's a different sure. beast. I mean, it's they're they're sort of chalk and cheese in many ways. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in there, and so it's pretty cool. I don't know the uh, I don't know how, how much soft tube stuff you use, yet, uh, yeah, Adam. I mean, no, because their hardware stuff, the integration, you know, the the channel strip and the and that. I love just, you know, the yeah, I love the the console one or channel one where yeah, whatever one. they have the the thing that integrates with their SSL channel. Uh, channel strip, which we, is a great experience, and I also love the sound of the of the plugin of the the SSL channel. They the, they know what they're doing, and uh, so I bet. I mean, from the demos, this synth this synth uh, sounds pretty good. Um, it's kind of gritty enough. I think that in general, I'm starting to see more and more plugins that either emulate uh, hardware synths or mm. are new, mainly mainly modeling, I think, that are starting to sound decent, um, yeah. which, is, which is nice. Because so far, yeah. uh, it was only the, the sample-based ones that, you know, it's just a recording like the um, one we just talked about, um, the Kawaii uh, yeah. library. Uh, but then it has, you know, obviously it comes with limitations because it's sample, so you can't really change the, the filters or anything like that. You can add stuff on top of it, but um, um, but yeah, the GeForce stuff sound, you know, uh, sound sounds mm -hmm. amazing. Um, the OB. O, uh, what's it called? Yeah, the OB, 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 OBE. OB, yeah. OBH, OB, OB, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. That sounds that sounds really really good, and I'm starting to. But that was, I think, for me, like ahead of the the curve. Right, ahead of the curve. Uh, but it's interesting. I wonder what it is. Well, we get this once in a while, like. don't we? Where we get this kind of like plateaus, and then suddenly there's a sort of Sure. It's like there's a kind of uh, a collective knowledge base of, of how to do it and, and it starts to filter through and people can't start utilising techniques yeah. that perhaps have been the uh, in sort of more rarefied circle. So everything starts to sound better. So, yeah, I mean, but the soft tube stuff one does sound thing, good. Yes, it, yeah. One thing with, the, with this synth particularly um, is the proof is going to be in the poly mod on the filter which is basically filter fm because right. you have to really oversample that when you're doing a digital emulation of filter fm otherwise you get the most aliasing more than any other sort of digital process like ring mod or anything you're going to get wild aliasing so they've probably had to do it internally at 96 kilohertz or something like that at least at least to avoid Pro probably, a bit of that probably more three eight probably four more. or something yeah yeah hopefully so um yeah yeah um i'm gonna listen to some demos and see uh see yes. what it's all about good plan yeah. okay well that sounds cool uh let's see um we have anything else that we want to go with here uh, well, there was that last one that you you put in, which was uh, that I've rather um, foolishly called it the bake noise, which I thought was kind of, <laughs> I thought that was actually quite good, actually. So, yeah, and this uh, Tom, who's there uh, from Synth Anatomy, um, they've just uh, announced. I think they've mentioned it before. I, I haven't got any video and stuff because it's as as ever. Apparently, it's shipping soon, but it's a pretty much a clone of the maths make noise, which you know, in, on even itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Apart from the fact that they still make that, and I obviously saw that uh, maths yes. was was and has been and probably continues to be one of the highest uh, selling uh, make noise modules, if not modules of yeah. all time. So that's kind of cool apart from the fact i think they say it's shipping now at 99 your, uh, bucks which it seems like a bit of a kick in the teeth and it's not like well mm. what you're trying to prove here it's like you, you know unless you've got a massive factory in the china you shouldn't be making an, that much money i don't know it feels weird i'm sure it'll be fine although from what people have said about a number of uh, the 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 Behringer Eurorack stuff, they're fine, but they're, they're not quite as durable. They're a bit more wibbly. I mean, you, you posted this sure. one. Did you have any thoughts on it, uh, Paulie? I threw, I threw up my arms in the air and was like, oh, late-stage capitalism again. But um, 
I think really the sort of issue is it's one thing for Beringer to clone old Roland stuff. You know, or old, I don't know, Cor well, maybe not old Korg stuff. Old Roland stuff where Roland are resolutely not really interested in re-releasing and that much analogue stuff, you know, they do the occasional thing. And it's one thing for them to do that. It almost feels like a little bit of a democratisation of analogue almost, where, yeah. where people who couldn't get their hands on this stuff can do it. You know, sticking it to the man almost. But this seems like... Something completely different. It's it's ripping off a boutique mod module from a smaller seller that are, are currently selling it. Um, it's it just do, it just doesn't sit quite as right with me, you know. I'm like, yeah, oh, I think I think that's not fair cool, enough. bro. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Too. I mean, I know because um, you you big fan of the Deep Mind, as I am, I yo and and also the uh, well the um, what was the red one? I can't even remember what it's called now. The 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 the, pod, the mono synth that was really really yeah, good. Yeah, uh, new, neutron. Neuron, neutron. That's it. Those two, fantastic. And you know the stuff that you can't get. I agree, but it seems a little bit um, aggressive to go after stuff that's currently manufactured from. It's, yeah. it, it's not. I mean, for, uh, first of all, I don't know how they they can get away with with it legally because it's the same thing and it's uh, and it's a product that's selling. So I don't know, but obviously they can. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's a business, and um, you know, for for the users, I suppose it's beneficial. Uh, for mm. for make noise, it's it's not so much. Yeah, uh, because it, I presumably it does the same things, and since it's uh, DC anyway, there's no kind of sonic element to it. All it does is is manipulates. DC yeah. and uh, and triggers, not even triggers. I think just DC. Um, so uh, it's curious. So it, it's probably it's... going to sound the same. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Could uh, I? Um... How much is the original one? How much is the make two, noise two, one? Well, it, it, uh, the make noise one is two nine five uh, pounds. Uh, you can buy it for at the moment. Yeah. I think I've got that right. And the abacus, which is the uh, what they're calling this is uh, going to be ninety nine bucks, and it's they're shipping it now. And I, and I think I think the thing is they probably what it, what it is, and this happens up further up the the food chain with you know larger companies is if you yeah. don't protect your IP well enough and you haven't got the patents, then then people will come for you, you know, and that mm. sort of feels like maybe what's happening it, here. Which I, it's, it's just not tasteful. quite compatible. It's not quite compatible with the kind of belief system behind a lot of not only Eurorack, but pedal manufacturers. So it's it's often known that people clone one another's stuff. It's happened for years, you know. People clone a circuit from like a Big Muff or whatever. But within that kind of almost... It's almost... A, it is... It, it People do make money and have businesses, but it's also a slightly more socialist kind of one for all and all for one kind of... Uh, approach where if you clone something, maybe you add your own spin on it or something. Mm. You add maybe one thing to it, add your own spin on it, and then you don't directly undercut anyone else kind of thing. So it's it's almost kind of having a business but not running the business solely to drain everyone else's profits. And I think that's what the difference with, Be with Beringer is. The less interested in cloning in a kind of consensual ethical way and just more interested in you know cloning and selling i should probably i should probably add allegedly on the end of that just because sure sure the sort allegedly, of thing I yeah. Do. but yeah no i think so i think it's, <laughs> uh, I, and i think the um apparently I, Apparently, that I think they're going for the. It's more inspired by Buchler, which is where the original module was inspired by as well. So I suppose in some ways it's fair game. It's just very cosmetically similar, and the layout is similar. In which case, why not just make it different? Which would be fine. But then you're not. Uh, probably shouldn't dwell on it too much. There's other stuff to come in. Um, I'm just trying to think if we've got any. Uh, da, 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 uh, let me see. Um, 
Uh, I don't think we've got we've got any more topics. Oh yeah, synfo on Gearspace. Why don't we do that one just very quickly? Uh, this was just uh, I think is that right? Should be. Yeah, here we go. This was our uh, agree. Here we go. This was a, a poll on Gearspace, which is uh, view poll. So, which do you uh, use more if, uh, often, analog synths or digital synths? Which is a, and it's a little bit misleading because it, it digital means digital hardware and plugins. This is just a bit of fun, really. But it's a, it's a, approximately fifty fifty with a slight edge on digital, as it would be because there's more of it. But it was interesting. Um, TJ on the road uh, posted, I don't know and I don't care. I use the synth in front of me at the moment of inspiration. I rotate through my collection to make sure they're all loved. And it really depends on what's going on. I mean, I know, Yoad, you, you know, you have stuff. You probably would shy away from analog things that you can't control completely from the computer for total recall and that but that's for you know that's for kind of workflow purposes and it makes sense you know you understand that and i think that's probably the case for a lot of people i just wondered if you had any thoughts yeah so that that uh, element automatically reduces the kind of um in terms of workflow if i have to every time i use a, a hardware synth whether it's analog or digital i have to either dump the SysX from it, which I can usually request using my modified, you know, BCR 2000. I can request it and it will get recorded uh, into the session, uh, or I have to somehow store it. That's what I do normally, uh, unless it's a minimal go, something like that, or MS-10 that, that you can't. Um, I'm less fanatic about um, being able to recreate the exact sound because I have it recorded as audio, and um, but I do store it. So automatically it lengthens the, the process of recording as opposed to a plugin, which is already there. It's stored with the session. You don't have to think about it. Um, so I think that in terms of convenience, there's there's no not you know it's not even comparable. It's the same thing as uh, mixing in the box and you know mixing on yeah. on an on a desk. Um, so in that sense, but I have to say you know, and I do use a lot of uh, a, a lot of analog, um, a lot of analog sounds. I would say I, I use Nexus a lot, and on Nexus there are so many huge amount of of, of analog sampled synths. So it's really easy if you're looking for something and it's right there. And does it sound a hundred percent different to the you know the the analog of, of, of which it was sampled, the analog hardware synth? It sounds about five six percent. The, the question is whether the, the, the song you're working on at the moment, whether the type of production and the genre um, will benefit or suffer from... So if you're working on something kind of quite minimal but analog in nature, then you want the bass and the low end, you want to, to feel that something that only a, a, a real analog hardware synth can, can give or can provide. Um, as well as the top being kind of clear and uncolored and un, you know, it, with with the digital with the plugins, it all sounds a bit blue at the top. You know, it doesn't quite um, from reasons which were, I'm fully aware of. You know, the sample rate uh, and and things like that. Um, but sometimes you just get on with stuff and the and being able to to just get an, a cool sound and and get inspired by it and record it and it's there it's there as opposed to going there tweaking it Feeling maybe that. yeah recording bounce recording it mm -hmm. to audio all this process is just lengthy and sometimes in sessions you have that kind of tempo of exploring and doing that and sometimes it's about getting something fresh and and just yeah. uh, without too much thought and uh, and letting kind of the intuition dictate the the tempo of the whole mm. session 
Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I think that's a really valid point. I mean, you know, this isn't really necessarily an analog versus digital debate. I wasn't what my intention to kind of to bring that up, and I, I don't think that's where we're going. Um, it's more a question of it's just like what do you need when you're working? I mean, assume, we assume mm. you're working. I mean, if you're just noodling at home and doing whatever, then do what makes you feel good. It really doesn't matter. But if, let's juxtapose that you in your room noodling around, fiddling about, but there's a director behind you going, I've got a train to catch, you know, then then apply that <laughs> that approach to that because they might not care whether it's but I want to use the, the analog or not then they don't care they just go yeah that's great or they yeah that's not or you might be in the position where you have to make those decisions sometimes because digital is much quicker in that mm. respect but you do get a more you know, you get a, a less bespoke element to it because it's been you know someone recorded it someone made a patch maybe i mean you know in some of those situations but in other situations you know you'll still have all that ability to to tinker and do with it i mean you use a lot of digital hardware don't you i mean so it's like i do you know horses for courses as it were yeah i think i think i my answer was mainly digital because although i have quite a bit of analog it's it's not where my heart is um, I don't know whether the, I don't know being being born in '82, just at the start of the di when digital coming in. You're infused with that it. differently. <laughs> yeah, I fused with a DX7 sometime in 1983. Um, but um, yeah, I think on the tracks I make, I'm probably using half plugins then about 30 or 40 percent digital hardware doing various weird things that none of my plugins do and then probably the last 10 to 20 percent i'm using analog usually the poly brute because it's right here or the yeah. ob6 and why, or and why wouldn't or, you frankly because it's yeah and it's got yeah. a it's got or, a performance skewed interface hasn't it it's d designed yes, to, yeah. to make you perform i mean there's some analog stuff that's, that's horrible to use just because it's hor it's badly designed you know whereas yeah there's some digital stuff which is a joy to use because it's beautifully designed so it's really dependent on that I it's guess. got this weird wood grain mobile phone case thing yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> which Love which it. is actually kind of cool um but yeah um so I th but I think, to be honest, yeah, digital is is the main is the main thing for me. Um, sometimes I'll use Tal Noisemaker, which is a free VST. If I really don't want to switch anything on, and I need just an an analog part, I'll use Tal Noisemaker, which actually sounds brilliant. It's like a two VCO synth with some FM. Uh, and it's my favourite free VST ever. I think it's you know it's great yeah, to just something very, really quick. Very highly thought of, isn't it? I know that. Yeah, yeah. The towel stuff is, isn't it? It for, certainly for is. So okay. Yeah, that's that. Excellent. Well, um, I hope we put that in. I, I'm sorry I didn't get around to any of your questions. We actually had more topics than I anticipated. But uh, there'll be no show next week because uh, we'll be in Berlin. Uh, but there will be, uh, hopefully, an, a, a lot of videos coming up. And there is going to be some new hardware. I think people... Uh, Nam was bit synth light but i think there's some stuff going to be there at uh, super booth hopefully more than we even know about i mean often is the case we don't get a heads up on everything yes. so do stay tuned uh do stay tuned to the to the whole thing uh, that our workflow is being tweaked even now so we'll be able to bring you more and more stuff so i do hope and if you see us there come and say hi uh, we'll be there for the whole duration we actually get there on wednesday uh and leave leave sunday i think i fly back sunday so we're there for the whole whole time of the show um yo i'd lovely to have you uh you're are you getting back to to, to sampling for your nexus uh, next nexus library absolutely and uh um does that mean you are you, are you working in that room now where just are you are you diing or are you miking for a lot of that stuff no are actually you... uh joel my engineer is working in the control room at the moment doing some stuff so i'm i just uh, you know did the show from here today uh, usually i just grab stuff and take it to the other room uh, if it's electric guitars and stuff acoustic instruments obviously i record here in the live room yeah 
<clears throat> Excellent. Well, I look forward to that. I'm sure it'll be done uh, as soon as you could possibly make it do. But you, your work, your work rate is a, a bit legendary, so I expect it'll be ready Monday, I'd imagine, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, lovely to see you. And uh, Paulie, lovely to see you too. Um, when's Indeed. your video going to be out? Everybody's waiting. Probably another week. Oh, yes, okay. sorry. So pretty soon. For, well, I don't have a Patreon yet, so they're, they're not paying me to wait, at least. No, that's <laughs> true. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, po fair probably enough. another week. I've got the voiceover done, so, yeah, it'll be out. Excellent. Well, glad to hear that. Well, uh, that's it. Oops, it's what's, where's my button? That's the button I want, isn't it? Yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's been great to have you all here. Thanks very much to all our uh, live listeners and uh, those who are listening after the fact. That was Sonic Talk, episode uh, 755. Uh, we'll see you all in the next one, which will be a week Wednesday. See you later. Bye-bye now. <laughs>